I spoke about strategies to reduce the risks of late effects related to radiation therapy. And there were three major points that I was trying to uh, bring across. The first is to understand the circumstances in which late, late, late second malignancies are actually a clinical priority. And so, for example, in the case of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, uh, late effects from radiotherapy are not actually a clinical priority. Uh, the patients typically have about a 10 times higher risk of dying of their primary lymphoma than they would of developing a second uh, uh, cancer related to radiation therapy. And so in this scenario, for example, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the clinical priority really ought to be about curing the initial lymphoma. In contrast, in uh, young patients with highly curable diseases like early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, this is a much more, this is a clinical scenario where late second uh, malignancies are much more clinically important. So the first point was to understand when are second malignancies important and when are they you know, a, a distant second in terms of clinical priority. The second point I was trying to make uh, was uh, related to understanding the uh, circumstances in which patients benefit from radiation therapy. And so we are in a time now where uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm about using PET imaging, and I think PET imaging has been a fantastic advance. However, I do think that we've terribly oversimplified uh, how we use and conceive of PET imaging, particularly as it relates to uh, the direction of radiation therapy. So we have a five-point scale, and then we actually distill a five-point scale down to basically negative or positive, and we live in a time where uh, people would like to say pet negative cases don't need radiotherapy. I think actually this throws away all kinds of useful information that would help us better select patients for radiation therapy, in including things like the anatomic response, other clinical factors. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of understanding the genetics of how we will select patients to receive radiotherapy. And if we can do that in a more sophisticated way, other than just saying PET negative patients don't need radiation therapy, then we'll have a better chance of maximizing the beneficial effect that we know radiation therapy has for many patients. And then finally, the last point was that among patients who are going to get radiation therapy, that we should employ all the uh, modern technologies that are available to us to reduce the dose of uh, radiation to normal tissues. So for example, we can use intensity modulated radiation therapy, we can use what's called uh, volumetric arc radiation therapy, and uh, even in some locations uh, we can use proton therapy. And so these are uh, techniques that we can use to reduce normal tissues. And what we've learned is that by employing these technologies that currently patients receiving radiation therapy are often receiving normal tissue doses that are less than half, often 20% of what they were historically. And so when we look at the late effects uh, that were experienced by patients treated in the 1980s, for example, we would now expect that those late effects would be substantially reduced and that therefore the therapeutic ratio, so to speak, the benefit of the radiotherapy as compared to the risk would also be enhanced by reducing the, the side effects related to that normal tissue dose.